Okay, morning and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for day one of our regional dialogue on delivering Caribbean climate ambitions, climate finance, civil society, and partnerships. Before I hand over to Mrs. Uname Gordon, Principal Director of Climate Change Division in Jamaica to give welcome remarks, I just wanted to do some quick virtual housekeeping before we get started. So um, I think everybody's very familiar using Zoom with COVID and all of us having to do virtual meetings, but just a quick reminder that we're asking people to mute your microphones and turn off your cameras um, unless you're speaking, particularly during this early part of the session where we have presentations and panel discussions, um, just to make sure that we're not distracting the speakers, but also to make optimal use of the bandwidth because we have, I think right now, over 100 people um, on the uh, Zoom platform. Also, uh, you can use the chat box if you have any queries or if you're experiencing any technical issues. Uh, we have a support team, including Aaron Peter and Anastasia Likwai, who will just be checking up on people. So if you have anything, you can also put it in the chat if you're having any difficulties. And also feel free to raise your hand or use the chat if you wish to post any questions during the Q&A sessions, um, we'll let you know um, when you, obviously you can post questions whenever you wish, but we'll let you know specifically when we're having the Q&A sessions and you can do so. And finally, um, I just wanted to note that we are recording uh, this session and we will be able to share a web link to the session today, as well as the sessions on day two and three, as well as the slides. Um, so don't worry if for some reason you're going to miss a bit of the session or you want to share the session with colleagues, um, you will be able to do so. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Unume to bring welcome remarks and introduce our amazing dialogue. Thank you so much, Anka. Um, the best partner we could have in, in this dialogue. Um, Ambassador Blacklane, my colleague um, from, from Antigua and Barbuda and the chair of AOSIS, um, let me recognize you. Let me recognize our own Dr. Orville Gray from the, the GCF, our regional manager for the Caribbean and Brazil, um, and the rest of the, the GCF team that has supported us, Mahendra in particular, who has the readiness portfolio, Naranda, and Ali has support in the, in the Secretariat. Um, welcome. My fellow GCF NDAs from across the region, across the Caribbean region, um, welcome. Um, our partner in this process of implementation, Canary, Nicole, Anka, and the team at Canary, um, welcome. Distinguished colleagues from the five C's, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, the CDB and the ISD um, partners and presenters this morning. Our very vibrant civil society community and partners and friends in this, in this process, ladies and gentlemen, all colleagues across the region. For me, it is, it is really a great privilege, humbling privilege. Sorry, I, I'm not sure what happened there. But as I was saying, um, that we should have been meeting face to face, um, but as COVID would have it, we cannot, but we will not let COVID disrupt our discourse across the region and actions that we, we need to take towards building this low carbon and climate resilient future for our region. We are well aware and in Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica and across the region of the impacts of climate change on, on our development trajectory. And so we are humbled and happy to be here this morning. Lives as we know continue to be impacted profoundly and many years of development gains um, get erased with just one small event, but we have to press along and we have to continue to make this concerted effort, not just to bounce forward better, but to build back greener. 
civil society actors and the organizations that they lead have a special and important role to play. So I speak this morning on behalf of all my NDA colleagues from across the region, taking this opportunity to especially welcome leaders and civil society members that operates within the space and across all the spheres across the region. Today, your presence testifies that the region's determination to join national and regional efforts to address climate action is at a good place. Let me be frank, really, really very frank, as I know no other way to do it. Adapting to climate change is really no easy task. Still for us, it is possible with the support and guidance from public sector agents as ourselves, the capital infusion, commitment from the private sector, and the drive and passion that we get out of our civil society actors. This is what makes the difference. To us, civil society agents have a critical and unique role to play in driving the climate change agenda towards this low carbon and climate resilient pathway. And let me, let me just highlight a few that we can identify with. Civil society must have access to finance and channel this to the local level. In particular, the marginalized and vulnerable communities. As Dr. Gray liked to say, adaptation is local. Civil society can participate in our technical advisory meetings and they are on all the panels, all the meetings. They share scientific knowledge, but more importantly, bringing that much needed local knowledge that is needed to craft the interventions and the practical interventions. And we need to be held accountable as agents of government. And this is a mad big role for civil society, accountable for our actions as we craft these solutions. And civil society advocates and their voices and concerns of marginalized society and the most vulnerable um, in our society and our, the community and the people should not go unnoticed. And Finally, I will say that civil society must and should receive financing because they are capable of implementing the climate change um, projects effectively. Let me <laughs> candidly also say that without your support on the ground, in the communities, governments cannot respond with any measure of success. So in closing, let me, let me highlight a little why we were so forceful in advancing this readiness project and on behalf of the, the civil society organization across the region. And I must say we did it for the private sector. Um, you, you will know that we, we are also lead on a private sector um, readiness initiative, which is also a readiness initiative. But more importantly for us, we recognize, as I said, the value of engaging civil society in climate finance and decision making both at the national and the regional level. And it is for this reason, three years ago, coming out of the GCF um, Structured Dialogue for the Caribbean, which was held in Grenada, we collaborated with Canary to conceptualize this project. Um, Canary, we are aware, is well capacitated and positioned to lead this effort for Caribbean civil societies. And you will hear more about it from the, from the team a little bit later. We could not have chosen a more fitting partner to provide this leadership, mentorship, guidance, and direction. Thank you, Nicole and Anka, and the team and thank you all our partners from across the region for being here. Welcome again. Thank you. And I hope that over the two, three days, you will enjoy the dialogue. Welcome to this and back to you, Anchor, for the continuance. Thanks again.
welcome. Thanks very much, Inume. A great welcome as always. Um, I think definitely have set the tone for the rest of the meeting. Um, next, we will be having um, remarks from Dr. Oval Gray, who is currently the regional manager for the Caribbean and Brazil in the Division of Country Programming at the Green Climate Fund GCF. Um, welcome, Oval. Um, thanks very much for staying up very late <laughs> to give remarks all the way from South Korea, over to you. Thank you, Anka. Um, it, it, it's always hard to come after Yunami when she starts, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Her Excellency Ambassador Diane Blacklin, representatives from GCF NDAs, accredited entities and delivery partners, representatives from development partners, ladies and gentlemen all, thank you. I offer greetings on behalf of the Executive Director, Mr. Yannick Blemerick, and the Director of Country Programming, Mr. Pa Usman Jarju of the Green Climate Fund GCF Secretariat. It is my pleasure to address you all as a partner during this regional dialogue delivering Caribbean climate ambitions, climate finance, civil society, and partnerships, stressing on the partnerships aspect. Firstly, because I have first hand knowledge of the challenges which regional civil society organizations face with understanding and navigating the climate finance space. And secondly, because it represents a significant milestone in a commitment by NDAs in the region with GCF support to address this challenge. Back in 2017, <clears throat> as you know me mentioned, during the GCF structured dialogue for the Caribbean region, Canary underscored the importance of giving CSOs a meaningful place at the climate finance table. This advocacy led to CSO engagement being identified as one of the region's priorities. The region's NDA is committed to supporting CSOs with gaining insights into the climate finance landscape that would facilitate their participation. The result was joint allocations by several countries from their annual GCF 1 million allocation to develop a two-year readiness initiative with a total value of US 1.3 million. This support from the NDAs of Antigua and Barbuda, Belize, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and Suriname will seek to sensitize, train, and build the capacity of CSOs in engaging with the GCF and with other climate finance institutions. This initiative, although directly targeting these seven Caribbean SIDS, also benefits the other Caribbean SIDS through deliverables, such as guidelines for CSO engagement, regional online open access knowledge platform on building community resilience in the Caribbean, the documentation and sharing of cases of innovation by regional and national CSOs, across the CARICOM region, and eventually climate change concept notes for interventions led or co-implemented by CSOs based on civil society agenda and action plan and GCF country programs, and last but not least, this week's dialogue. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, although we recognize that the implementation of this readiness initiative is not a panacea for the issues faced by CSOs, we see it as an important step along the right pathway. This pathway will also include a concept note to support a GCF funded activity proposal, hopefully in the near future. Additionally, support and engagement of CSOs is in keeping with GCF's updated strategic plan 2020 to 2023, which seeks to support broad-based and inclusive stakeholder participation in GCF activities, including local communities and authorities, civil society, private sector, indigenous peoples, and others to ensure needs and concerns are put into local context. Therefore, having CSOs as forefront stakeholders contributing to the development of GCF projects for the Caribbean is not only laudable, but a strategic move in taking country ownership to another level. We therefore encourage NDAs and accredited entities to continue in engaging CSOs meaningfully beyond this dialogue. We encourage CSOs to approach this world of climate finance 
with the same fortitude that you have shown in pioneering social and environmental change in your local context. Embrace this opportunity and increase your understanding of how to navigate the climate finance system. Take note of what is required and leverage your unique competencies for the benefit of your constituents. At the GCF, we are ready to support CSOs as you work with NDAs and our network of accredited entities and delivery partners. Some of you may also be interested in being part of GCF's observer network joining other civil society organizations such as Canary, or our network of accredited entities and delivery partners, or even serving as executing entities to support the implementation of low carbon and climate resilient projects. In whatever way you choose to engage with us, we look forward to supporting you in keeping with our mandate and for the benefit of the region. I take this opportunity to wish you a productive and successful CSO regional dialogue. Thank you. Thanks for those very insightful remarks, Orville, um, and for taking the time to join us um, despite the time difference. And I know also the GCF board meeting is underway. And so you have a lot of other duties, but we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we will now have Her Excellency, Mrs. Diane Blacklane, Ambassador for Climate Change and Director of the Department of Environment in Antigua and Barbuda who's also representing Antigua and Barbuda as the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States Oasis. Over to you, Diane. Thank you, Anka. Um, and thanks for everybody. And thanks for this opportunity to, um, to see this project get off the ground. So um, my job here is to provide some brief remarks and I'm hoping that I can provide remarks that would help us to think over the next few days of this dialogue. And as um, Una May indicated, and as others have indicated, NGOs, um, we keep saying NGOs play a critical part. So let me just rephrase that means, I mean, not being patronizing. Without NGOs, this is, we, we can't get to where we need to go. I mean, it's just not possible. So NGOs need to create a new posture for themselves. So, you know, when you think you're, you're pestering people or you're, you're not needed, you, you, you create one posture. When, you, when you're really needed, you need to understand that and your posture change, right? You, you don't get to fight for a seat at the table. You get to ask how many seats do I get, right? So it's not, you don't get to say how much money I'm fighting and scrapping for money among NGOs. It is how much money should, do I need to get to do my job, to play my part in this whole climate dynamics that we're seeing playing out. And I, I think it's very important for us to have that posture and to know that you are, you are here to, to help and you are here to participate and you have a right to participate. And the government cannot do it on its own. And we know that and we see this, and, but we just have to accept it. You know, not in an arrogant way or anything like that, but just to, to make sure that you're there to show up to help. So um, in Antigua and Barbuda, we have an accredited entity to the Green Climate Fund, the Department of the Environment, and the director <laughs> for the Department of the Environment. That's my son kicking the ball on my glass window, by the way. Um, I'm home with my children today because they're homeschool. So he's playing sports and I'm, I'm watching through the window to make sure I'm being his coach. Um, we have an accredited entity in, in the Department of the Environment, and we got a very ambitious accreditation. And it was a shock to many people in the board of the Green Climate Fund. We are, we are accredited for up to $50 million. We can do project management, we can do grants, and we can do um, loans of up to $10 million. We are, we are accredited for micro loans, not small. And many persons in the region ask us, how did we do that? And the bigger, the, the more likely you are to program, this is basically simply how it is. Um, it's not as simple as this, but let me explain. The more partners you have to spend money, the more money you'll be assigned. So if Department of Environment alone and the government alone was put forward as potential executing entity, as Orville pointed out, we would have been accredited as micro. But in our accreditation, we put forward, we are going to work with NGOs and we're gonna provide a certain amount of all the funds we receive to NGOs. 
and we put forward that that's going to be 15%. We also said we're going to engage the private sector. And we said a significant amount of money is going to the private sector. So in the, if we can access $50 million a project, in each project, we structure a huge amount for the private sector, large amount for NGOs, and the rest goes to the government. Now, that was a winning combination for the Green Climate Fund. And this is why there was no, this is why we got such a great accreditation. And we want NGOs to understand that we got it because we mentioned we will be working with NGOs. We will be spending money with the NGOs. We will be making them our executing entity. They'll be taking project management role as an executing entity. They'll be accepting grants and giving grants, um, working with us together. And they're gonna help us to sell our message and put the, the word out on the ground to help us to work with our most vulnerable people in our community. And this is, this is how we got a, such a great accreditation. So I want any NGO listening to understand the Department of Environment in Antigua and Barbuda is a national accredited entity. And we have the same size accreditation as five C's, as the Caribbean Development Bank, and as the same accreditation as the United Nations Environment Program. And the reason why we got such an ambitious accreditation is because we're going to have an ambitious program to engage the NGO community. And now we're following through and we're working with Canary, we're working with Uname and everybody else and all the NDAs in the region so that we can do the same thing throughout the Caribbean. So if you think you're not necessary, if you think, and we're not just greenwashing to say we're working with NGOs and then we don't work, we collect the money and don't work with NGOs. No, no, no. We actually put into our legislation that we are bound by law to provide at least a minimum of 15% to NGOs. We're bound by law and we're doing our first annual um, financial report in which we're going to report on that obligation. And that will be done for the year of 2020. We're bound by law. So this is not just talk or we're greenwashing and saying anything we want to say to the GCF or most donors and not deliver. We are delivering on that. The question is, are NGOs ready? And some of them are not, not enough ready. But it's okay, right now, based on our projects, we have enough to program the funds that we have. And that is great. And this is why we're so grateful for Can to Canary because we can reach out to them and say, could you help me with this NGO, please? Can you help me build their capacity? Can you help them to spend this money? Can you help them? Let me help me to design a report that anybody can write. You know, because we all know the problem that we have is writing these reports, right? Um, so the other thing, so we have to get them into the habit of writing reports. That is a big deal for them. But once they get into the habit, once you structure a nice report for them, we even have them doing video reports, verbal reports, and many still do um, written reports. So um, we're, we, and we love working with the NGOs. Now, nobody, okay, I know we love our people in the Ministry of Finance, right, Una May and everybody else who work with government. We love our Ministry of Agriculture. Oh, they're our people, but Lord of mercy, the bureaucracy is killing us. <laughs> so the bureaucracy is something else. With NGOs, that is not an option. That is not a, so you get to work with heavy bureaucracy, which can really bring your spirit down, really drag the energy out of you. And then you work with these NGOs and they're just so excited. They're so amazing. They are ready to go and they can mobilize quickly. And it's just fantastic. So when you work with both ends of the spectrum and then you work with the private sector, it does jazz up your work program and help you to, to, to feel better about yourself. When, you, when one, you know, the government is moving a little slow, the NGOs will move a lot faster. So you, you get to claim victory even when you're still really implementing. So this is why we love to work with it, NGOs. So NGOs are not only necessary, they're fun to work with. Really, they just jazz up your whole work program. So you're fun to work with. So it's not, you know, what we're talking about. Now let's talk about what is the value of the NGO with respect to some of the areas where I think we need to improve. Um, and this is not an NGO loan issue, this is the issue for government as well. We all talk about in the Caribbean about our climate change program and why is it it's so hard to access funding. The governments complain about that all the time, we all hear about it. So if our government having problems, our NGOs will also have problems. It's a partnership, we can't do it without each other, just remember that. The thing is, is that in the Caribbean, to, to get to where we want to go, at the speed we want to go, without selling our souls and our bodies and our land and our beach and our marine space and our blue economy um, to get ready for hurricanes, 
we have got to do one thing. We have to diversify the instruments, the financial instruments that we are currently using in the Caribbean. It's a must. If you go to the United States and they are working on climate change issues, most of the financial instrument that they use to get to where they want to go, same with Europe and others, it's equity. They go to the capital market and they get their money, equity. The government underwrites some of that risk to some extent, and so they can invest all they want. We don't have that. So in the Caribbean, in most of our Caribbean countries, we are programmed, we are trained, we went to university, and we're drummed in our heads how to use one major instrument, financial instrument, and that is loans. And the reason why we have such a high debt is because we love loans. We're only designed to program them. Our Ministry of Finance have a debt management unit, right? Um, where's your guarantee management unit? Where's your equity management unit? At least in the OECS, I don't see any, right? The debt management unit in Antigua also manage all of our work that we do on the regional market when we put up a um, perspectives and so on. So debt management unit, who looks into that? I mean, so we are structured for debt. And in a world where NGOs, um, Uname, guys will tell you when we go to COP, Orville, when we go to COP, anybody who's on the, sorry if I'm missing anybody when you're on the COP, and you go to the side events, hundreds of NGOs from different parts of the world, they're funded by the private sector, they're provided by the government, they're funded from everywhere. Money, so much money to support them. We don't have ours. We don't have ours. Because we in the Caribbean, we program loans. If you want a young lady to develop a project to go into energy management and to provide solar panels and so on, she has to go, a young lady in Antigua, in Jamaica, Dominica or Grenada, wherever you know, she has to go and borrow money. And she has to then leverage her family home as collateral. A young lady who wants to do that in New York, she just goes to the market. She come up with a great business plan. She has a good project team and she goes to the market and sell her idea and she get investors to back her. That is how it works, two completely different programming. So we have a structural issue in the Caribbean when it comes to um, accessing the financing that we need. And so many persons think, you know, you know, that financial thing on Wall Street is complicated and, and all of that. Yes, it's true. I'm a marine biologist. My brain can't wrap around any of that, but my brain can wrap around one thing that we all know. All of us may be raised, maybe not all of us, from, you know, poor families. But there, were an, there was an informal financial system that was going on. Many of us call it box hand. Many of us call it uncle something, auntie somebody who give us some money. There is an informal way in the Caribbean for us to invest with each other, jointly invest. And we take it for granted. We don't think about it. Think about it. How do we lend to each other? How do we invest with each other? Just like how the Jews and the, and the, and the Arabs do. They have investment system that is written into their religious laws. How do, but we do the same thing. We have a cultural way of doing it. And what we have done at the Department of the Environment, we met with these box hand holders. They're all women, militant women. They have a 99.99% payback rate. The banks in Antigua, the financial sector would love to have that sort of um, stand, uh, that sort of record. And they came to us and they told us how we did it. And we piloted our revolving loan program that we got with money from the GEF, the GCF, and the Adaptation Fund in the exact same way. We also used grants in Antigua and Barbuda to lend to low-income person with no collateral required. And if they get hit by a hurricane, we built in payment forgiveness, that deferral, into the loan payments. This is how we work at the community level among ourselves. And we need to look at the way that we grew as, as a culture, as a grow, grow as a community, grow as a country. It wasn't always the banking sector. In fact, many of our people in the region don't have access to financing in the formal banking sector. We depend heavily on the informal sector. Look at your informal sector, NGOs, look at them, see what it is that they do and see if we can model that and create a project to go to the GCF. We have to understand there are a lot of risks to many of these people, and they don't want to bring their asset, their little house that they work for two generations to get, to put it into the hands of a bank. And we recognize this. We talk to our people on the ground, and this is what they said to us. We talk to NGOs, I mean, this is what they said to us. 
And so we, this is how we're designing our program. So by the end of 2022, Antigua and Barbuda Department of the Environment will be providing to our community groups, our NGOs, grants, equity, loans, and of course, and they will also be executing projects on our behalf. We have already providing grants, they're already performing as executing entity, and we're gonna grow this even more. That is our intention, not because we love to, and we wanna look good and pat ourselves on the back, because we need to. So my, my task and what I would like to charge each of us to understand that for once we have a green climate fund, that we are on the board. We're on the board, we sit on the board as equal members to everybody else. And when I presented some of these ideas to the Green Climate Fund for our accreditation and how we design our projects, they were accepted. This is very new compared to the Jeff compared, and but the adaptation fund is also very flexible. So I just wanna say at this time, so we'll be able to get, be very successful in Antigua and we are successful because we have to see things what it is. We have to recognize how we need our partners. We just don't want them. We need them. So we bug all of our NGOs in Antigua. There are a lot of different instruments that we can use. We have experience. We don't have to be a Wall Street guru to get this done. All you have to do is just talk to the people in the community to see how they exchange um, goods and services. Many of our communities still batter. That is the way that we are going to design our equity system. We're going to take advantage of a battering system in Antigua and Barbuda that still exists and we're gonna turn that into an equity program for them. Finally, I just wanna say something that um, our governments themselves need to recognize that the reason why we have a debt problem is because we, are only, we can only process loans. Finally, we have to sit down, NGOs can understand that we can have an accredited ent entity in each country. So far, only I think Belize and Antigua and Barbuda have national um, accredited entity. Avil will tell you and Unime will tell you how much we fight and fight to get accredited um, that opportunity to have direct access entities. And you know what? We only have four or five in the Caribbean. That is very disappointing. And when we look at the how much climate change is gonna cost us, this is not enough. So we would look forward to um, NGOs to continue to do what they do best and that is advocacy and advocacy for governments to get up and go out and get the money that is out there. We can't go to the UN and complain how we're not getting money and stuff like that. When on a national level, we're not putting the systems in place to access it. Really, that is what it boils down to. It's in, uh, the ball is in our court now. And we want the NGOs to go to their government and to their private minister to say, the ball is in your court to go and access the funds. Why aren't you doing that? So I look forward to being on the panel later and I look forward to reading the results of this um, um, event. And I'm charging you now that we are asking NGOs to go for millions, go for grants, equity, loans, everything. We need everything to be able to address the issue of climate change. Thank you. Many thanks for that, Diane. I think that was a very, I think, um, thoughtful and very practical and you know you really shared some very um, useful perspectives from the work that you are doing in Antigua and Barbuda and you know you keeping it real and really helping I think to set the tone um, for the discussions over the next three days um, and we're definitely looking forward to you sharing further insights on the panel later this morning. So next, I will actually be doing a very brief presentation um, just to give people a little bit of background on the project that's actually supporting this regional dialogue. And so um, Diane is a hard act to follow, but I'll try my best to keep this short and interesting and just to provide some context for the work that we're doing. So firstly, greetings um, from sunny Trinidad, um, all established protocols observed. On behalf of Canary, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, I'm very pleased to introduce the project Enhancing Caribbean Civil Society's Access and Readiness for Climate Finance, um, through which uh, this regional dialogue on delivering Caribbean climate ambitions has been organized and funded. 
I think as Unime Orville and Diane Black Lane have so very ably pointed out, there is need for urgent and accelerated action on the climate crisis. This is very clear. And there's also much needed investment and needed to address recent socioeconomic upheavals due to COVID-19 over the last year. And really this can help set us on a path to inclusive, green and resilient recovery, as Unami mentioned. The need for a whole of society approach is also clear as Diane has so very effectively and ably sort of laid out because governments and the private sector cannot tackle the climate crisis alone. And so obviously enhancing civil society leadership and their capacity for climate action is critical. Building on the important work we already do as already very kind of well kind of laid out in terms of advocacy for changes in policy and practice at the national to global levels through well-known campaigns like the 1.5 to stay alive campaign through raising awareness within our communities that we serve and also through implementing practical actions to adapt and mitigate climate change across the Caribbean. However, many of the civil society organizations face a number of challenges in taking action as their efforts are often small scale, short term and disconnected from government and private sector efforts. And they often lack the necessary funding and technical support to really do the work they want to do. To address these challenges, this regional project was developed to really look at how we can enhance civil society's capacity, including the knowledge, skills, and organizational structures of national NGOs, nonprofits, and community-based organizations and their networks to access and deliver climate finance and better serve vulnerable communities on the ground. And it seeks to enhance the enabling institutions so that civil society has voice and can really actively participate in climate adaptation and mitigation and building resilience nationally and regionally alongside government and the private sector. So I wanted to actually just give a quick shout out in terms of the key partners for the project. We developed this in collaboration with seven national designated authorities across the Caribbean and leading civil society organizations with Jamaica's climate change division serving as the lead and six other authorities, including the Department of Environment in Antigua and Barbuda, the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development and Investment in Belize, the Department of Economic and Technical Cooperation in Grenada, the Department of Economic Affairs, and PSIP in St. Kitts and Nevis, the Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civil Aviation in St. Lucia, and the Ministry of Spatial Planning and Environment in Suriname. So Canary is serving as the implementing entity and delivery partner for the project, which we're very excited about, which is funded by a US 1.29 million grant from GCF's Readiness and Preparatory Support Program. We're implementing this work over 30 months. We started in February, 2020, and we'll end in August, 2022. Obviously the main target groups are civil society organizations at the community, national and regional levels, but we're also targeting key partners, including national designated authorities and accredited entities to the GCF. The project is regional in scope, covering all the CARICOM member states with targeted activities in seven countries, including Antigua and Barbuda, Belize, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and Suriname. There are four key components to the project focused on achieving the following outcomes. One, strengthening mechanisms for civil society engagement in decision-making at the national and regional levels. Two, increasing uptake of innovative climate change solutions among civil society organizations, the communities they serve, and other partners to scale up impact and better address the climate crisis with a focus on community-based and ecosystem-based solutions 
that builds socioeconomic and ecological resilience. Three, strengthen the capacity of civil society to directly access and deliver climate finance through the GCF and other funds. And finally, enhancing awareness and actions to integrate civil society interventions, as Diane very rightly pointed out, is something that we really need to do and to strengthen the overall pipeline of projects to the GCF. This includes developing at least two project contacts with CSOs to access funding from the GCF. So, COVID-19 has certainly caused some delays and disruptions in rolling out activities, but we did kick off a regional scoping study in September to collect information on current levels of civil society engagement and access to climate finance to inform work under the project. And the findings of this study will be presented in the next session today and on day two. We're also mapping civil society led initiatives on climate change to identify best practices and innovations for scale up and replication across the region. And we're very excited to be hosting this regional dialogue along with our partners as one of the key project activities to really bring together civil society organizations, government agencies, including NDAs, private sector funders and our international partners to really discuss and explore what are the options for improving access to climate finance and leveraging partnerships for a whole of society approach. We will also be launching a climate finance in action network for the Caribbean on day three as a platform to keep the conversation going and to mobilize knowledge and partnerships beyond this dialogue. The team and myself at Canary are particularly excited to be helping to convene this dialogue as a regional civil society organization. We're an independent nonprofit technical institute that has worked for over 30 years to promote participatory and pro poor approaches to managing natural resources and developing sustainable livelihoods. Our mission is to promote and facilitate stakeholder participation and the stewardship of natural resources across the Caribbean. Our work centers on four themes, biodiversity and ecosystems, equity and justice, participatory governance, and resilience. And under our resilience work, we're really focusing on building the resilience of communities, their local livelihoods, and the ecosystems they depend on to climate change and disasters. Through capacity building, research, policy influencing, and improving governance and access to finance. So this project, which is really focused on enhancing civil society leadership and capacity to access and deliver climate finance is therefore very firmly aligned with our core work and objective to build local resilience across the region. With that, I would like to wrap up my overview. If anyone has questions on the project, you can contact me as a project manager and there are also a number of national project coordinators across the country that the number of you will be familiar with. You can also check out our project webpage and brief using the URLs shown on this slide to get more information about the project. Thank you for your time and really looking forward to some fruitful and very strategic and insightful discussions that help us to realize our climate ambitions through what is a truly whole of society approach that actively engages civil society alongside government and the private sector. Thank you very much. And next I will be handing over to Mr. Alec Crawford from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, who will be giving a presentation on the findings from the regional scoping study on access to climate finance. Over to you, Alec. Thanks so much, Anka, and uh, lovely to see everyone. Thank you for having us today. It's great to see so many familiar faces and old friends, uh, even if we're not in person on Zoom. Uh, my name is Alec Crawford. I'm a senior policy analyst with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, ISD is working in partnership with colleagues from Climate Analytics to support the Canary team in this project and this regional dialogue. 
Uh, our team is based in Canada, the US and across the region. I'm uh, specifically right now uh, based in a very cold and gray Toronto. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty good bet that I would rather be where you are today, wherever that may be. Uh, but it's lovely to, lovely to be a part of this online. Um, what I wanted to do today was go over some of the findings from our uh, scoping study that Anka mentioned. Um, just to go over some of the initial findings, we're also going to cover some of this on day two. Uh, so I won't go through the entire report. I'll try to keep it reasonably uh, quick so that we don't take too much time away from what promises to be a very interesting panel discussion and uh, the breakout groups later on today. Uh, so thanks again for having us. So in advance of this dialogue, um, Climate Analytics and ISD developed together a draft scoping report, uh, the findings of which we'll present over the next couple of days, as I mentioned. Now, the two main aims for this scoping report were to identify and assess current mechanisms for multi-stakeholder engagement in climate change decision-making at the regional and national level, and to look at their effectiveness, particularly uh, with an emphasis on the engagement of civil society organizations. And then it was also to assess current levels of CSO access to and delivery of climate finance in the Caribbean, including from the Adaptation Fund, the GCF, and from the uh, Global Environment Facility. For the purpose of this, maybe just taking a step back quickly, for the purpose of this project, CSOs were defined as nonprofit, non-governmental organizations operating at the international, regional, national, and local levels. Uh, this includes NGOs, community-based organizations, and formal informal networks and associations. So the process of preparing the scoping report uh, included a few things. First, we, we worked with the Canary team to identify key national and regional CSOs that were working on climate change issues. Uh, we also conducted a mapping exercise where we mapped out key engagement mechanisms that we could find and CSO climate initiatives that are already underway or have recently wrapped in the region. And then uh, this was not only done through kind of desk-based research, but also through interviews. So we conducted uh, quite a few interviews with key government and CSO stakeholders from across the region. Uh, this was uh, you know, talking with NDAs, with national coordinators for the project, uh, with Dr. Gray at the GCF, with other uh, colleagues uh, that we were able to speak to that could offer insights into this um, into this question about CSOs and climate action across the Caribbean. In terms of the geographic spread, the interviews were conducted with stakeholders from across the CARICOM region, though particular attention was paid to the target countries that Anka mentioned, Belize, Jamaica, Antigua, Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, Grenada, and Suriname. So today I'd just like to quickly cover our baseline assessment. So uh, looking again at the state of CSOs in the region, according to experts from the region. So this is very much reflective of the conversations that we've been having with, uh, with many of you on the call today. I, it, it's not going to be surprising, and this was very much covered in the, in the opening statements, but CSOs can play a very unique and important role in achieving climate change ambitions uh, across the Caribbean. So not only do they increase resilience at both the community and national levels through their projects, their advocacy, their awareness raising efforts, um, they can also play a crucial role in connecting communities to governments. Uh, linked to this, we found that they can amplify community voices uh, and advocate for community needs, positions, and interests. They can often ground truth local climate change realities as mm -hmm. well. So by operating at the local level in local communities, they frequently have a more nuanced and much deeper understanding of the kinds of climate change impacts that are being experienced by households, by individuals, uh, and by communities, and how people are coping and adapting. Um, so they might have the, those understandings where governments don't have those understandings. So uh, another very important um, contribution that they can make. Finally, and I think, again, this was brought up both in the, the, the comments of the ambassador and, and Unime Gordon, uh, they can extend government capacities through the implementation of local mm -hmm. projects on climate change. There's no way that governments themselves uh, can solve the climate crisis on their own. They need the help of not only private sector actors, but also civil society organizations. And there seemed to be a broad recognition um, that governments that are already stretched in terms of their capacities can rely on CSOs to provide some support 
uh, to projects and programs at the local level. I think in the in the words of Una May Gordon, I can't top this, they jazz up the work program of governments. So um, I think that that's a, a crucial thing to remember. Uh, so as you all know, CSOs in the Caribbean vary in terms of their size, their mandate, and their geographic focus. Uh, we found that the majority were quite small uh, in terms of staff, usually less than 10. In terms of annual budget, usually less than about $250,000 US. And in terms of geographic reach, many again operate at the local or community level rather than at the national level. Uh, and many are also thematically focused on a particular issue such as youth empowerment, conservation, um, or maybe a particular economic activity, whether it's agriculture or fisheries. Uh, as Ambassador Blacklane discussed, size doesn't necessarily need to be a disadvantage. Um, it can also allow for a nimbleness and a flexibility that's not possible within governments. So let's keep that in mind uh, over the next three days. We found that there are a few CSOs actually focusing on climate change explicitly uh, and the environment that operate at the regional level. Uh, and this emerged as a clear gap during the interviews. So I'll quickly go over a few of the key barriers that came out of the research. Uh, so clearly CSOs have an important role to play in climate action, but what's stopping them uh, from accessing climate finance? Uh, again, through our research, we found a number of recurring themes that came up over and over again, both for national and for regional CSOs. Uh, the first was small size. So there is nimbleness there, um, but it's also, you know, they have limited, limited staff, um, limited geographic focus. Uh, it's difficult to get um, large tranches of funding from international climate uh, instruments, investment instruments, when, when that's the case. Also, they're operating at small, with small budgets. So when you're working on smaller local projects uh, with project budgets that are much smaller than the minimum level of funding offered up by international climate finance mechanisms like the GCF or the Adaptation Fund, um, it really can, uh, can affect your absorptive capacity. Uh, so if you're used to working with a small budget, you know, being able to manage a large budget can be, can be difficult. Those capacity constraints are not just with regards to financial management, but also reporting, auditing, the kind of requirements that come along with some of the climate finance that we're seeing um, can be outside of the capacities of uh, many CSOs operating in the region. There's also uh, maybe a lack of awareness or understanding, maybe limited awareness or understanding of climate finance options is a better way of putting it, um, whereby many of these smaller CSOs simply aren't aware of, of their options when it comes to climate finance. And I think that that's something that through awareness raising, um, we can start to address. There's also a lack of uh, time, again, because they're stretched in terms of their staff and their budgets, there's a lack of time for writing proposals. Uh, a lack of experience with that, a lack of capacity and knowledge of how to pull together these proposals. They're often seen as quite onerous when it comes to the application process, and that can get in the way of CSOs even trying uh, to apply. A few more key barriers that came up, uh, ad hoc government engagement. Uh, we found through discussions both with government and CSOs that uh, you know, oftentimes it's not a, a regular uh, a regular engagement from governments for CSOs, but, um, but rather it's ad hoc and based on kind of personal connections of government with CSOs, with specific CSOs. And it doesn't happen, again, on a regular basis, which can, um, can be an issue. This isn't the case across all countries, uh, but uh, it certainly came up uh, again and again. A lack of collaboration among CSOs uh, also came up. So some of these larger CSOs uh, can act as multipliers that help governments access the broader CSO community. So if you have an association or a network, for example, they might be able to disseminate information about climate change or climate action initiatives to their members. Uh, some can even act as maybe the principal implementing organization uh, in partnership or in a CSO consortium when it comes to implementing adaptation or mitigation actions. However, based on the research and the interviews that we did, these organizations seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, and this extends to collaboration among CSOs uh, at, the, at the local level. They're, they just don't seem to be coming together to try to you know, pool their capacities and their strengths uh, in order to access some of these larger amounts of funding. Uh, as I mentioned, 
many times there's a focus on things other than climate change and climate change is kind of secondary to their mandate. Uh, staff turnover can be an issue. Maybe capacities are built within a CSO and then the staff move on to another CSO taking those capacities with them. And finally, in, in quite a few contexts, there's a lack of formalization among CSOs. Uh, so they're not, um, they're not fully formalized and as such accessing these kinds of financing uh, is, is difficult. Again, these barriers apply uh, largely across both national and regional CSOs based on the research. So in terms of the numbers, uh, this is not not an exclusive list, but it's reflective of the recent projects we were able to find information for. Uh, and again, we welcome um, information from participants that are on the line. Uh, our, our parameters for the mapping exercise when we were looking at climate change, climate action initiatives was uh, recent projects, so kind of since 2017 to present, and then funding above about $50,000 uh, US. So those are the kinds of projects that we were looking at. Uh, as you can see from this infographic, uh, we were able to find a total of 40 projects. Uh, you know, 20 had an adaptation component, 20 also had a mitigation component. So there's a fairly good even split between the two. And then there were uh, three projects that had both adaptation and mitigation components. In terms of the average grant size, again, of the projects we were able to survey, so this is not an exclusive list, but on average, national projects were operating with a budget of about $70,000, whereas any regional projects that we found were much bigger, so $1.37 million. And then it's interesting to look at the sources of funding. Um, breaking this down, we saw again and again that for civil society organizations, the Jeff Small Grants Program again and again was coming up as a very good and very easy source of climate financing for CSOs. Uh, that's, um, you know, we'll get into why that mechanism was particularly successful throughout the, the course of the next three days, but um, it was seen as a model worth replicating by the other climate funds. And I think that there's movements within those con funds um, you know, toward that kind of a model, perhaps. Uh, in addition to the Jeff Small Grants Program, we had five projects from the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund UEA facility, two from Agence Française du Développement, and then one each from GCF Readiness, the World Bank, the Inter-American Foundation, Darwin Plus, Conservation International, and ICI BMU. So there was a, a reasonable range of uh, sources of funding, but as you can see, the Jeff Small Grants Program uh, was by and large the, where the majority of funding was coming from for CSOs for smaller projects. In terms of next steps, uh, as, as mentioned, we'll be discussing some of the mechanisms and some of the initiatives that we came across uh, over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, specifically tomorrow, we'll be talking about some of the mechanisms that we, we found in the mapping exercise and, and what was most effective about those. After this regional dialogue, we'll be finalizing the scoping report based on feedback that we've received both from NDAs, national coordinators, and again, any of you, if you have um, particular feedback to offer. We'll be developing case studies of good practice. So we're trying to pull together a handful of sort of one page case studies that offer up uh, good practice for, again, NDAs that are looking to, to further engage CSOs or CSOs that are trying to access climate financing. We'll be working with the Canary team to develop guidance for engaging CSOs in climate finance. So what can NDAs do um, when it comes to improving engagement with CSOs in, in climate action? And then as Anka mentioned, there will be a series of national workshops following on from this workshop, which will focus on trying to build some of those capacities um, within national governments and within CSO uh, communities in each of the seven target countries. Uh, I don't wanna take up any more time than that, knowing that we have a, a fantastic panel discussion coming up, but thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward to participating in the next uh, in the three-day meeting. And uh, I welcome any, any initial questions or feedback if, Anka, we have time to cover that reasonably quickly. Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, yeah, over to you, Anka. 
Uh, hi, Alex. Yeah, I think maybe let's take a couple questions um, if people have any on the scoping report. Um, we've got two to three minutes. So there is a question about access to the, re the scoping report um, that you just presented. Um, okay. So do you want to quickly um, let people know? Um, Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so the scoping report, as I mentioned, is still in draft form, but if there's interest in, in giving it a read and offering us any feedback, we would, we would welcome that. Um, and we will, we can provide uh, an email address for anyone who wants to reach out to, to the drafting team. Um, we'll do that in the chat. And, uh, and if you, if you want to reach out to, to learn more about the scoping report in its current stage, we're, we're happy to provide that. It's only, unfortunately, currently in English. I should, I should preface that. So, um, keep that in mind. I'll just put up a slide with the email addresses if people want to contact us. If there are no further questions, um, just looking at the chat now. Uh, do you want to move on to the panel discussion, Anka? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Let's do that. All right, so I can introduce the, the next panel and our moderator. So firstly, um, we're hoping to keep the discussion going with the next panel on applying lessons and innovations in financing civil society and local communities to build climate resilience, which will be moderated by Ms. Frances Fuller, Implementation Specialist at the Climate Analytics. She will introduce our four distinguished panelists. Um, over to you, Fan. Thank you, thank you, Anka. And um, thank you, Alec, for your presentation and setting the scene for us today. Um, good morning, everybody. And it's nice to see um, such interest in, in this dialogue for the first of, of three days. I am Fran Fuller. I'm the Deputy Director of Climate Analytics New York office, uh, as well as an implementation specialist. Um, and uh, today we have um, four distinguished panelists with us um, who will be discussing a few areas uh, looking at past and current experiences and lessons in financing CSOs and local communities in implementing climate action. Um, building local resilience and identifying some best practices and innovations as to where um, building on how we can access resources from GCF. Um, so I will start by introducing our panelists. First of all, we have um, Ambassador Diane Black Lane. Um, as was introduced earlier, she is Antigua Barbuda's Ambassador for Climate Change and the Director of the Department of Environment in Antigua and Barbuda, which is also the nationally, National Designated Authority and also was my first ever boss. <laughs> um, uh, as, as she outlined, the Department of Environment is an accredited entity to the GCF um, and has had experience quite recently in uh, executing a enhanced direct access project um, in the region, one of only two in the world. Um, next, we have Mrs. Nayari Diaz-Perez, Executive Director of PACT, Protected Areas Conservation Trust in um, Belize. And Ms. Diaz-Perez will share experiences as an accredited entity um, including supporting efforts uh, in financing CSOs in local communities. Pactus has some great experience in Belize in working with uh, a collection of CSOs. Next, we also have Ms. Leotard, Executive Director of Canary, who will bring some experiences and lessons from Canary's work as an intermediary providing small and medium grants to CSOs in the Caribbean including work under the Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund Car Caribbean program that could serve as a model for uh, climate financing. Last but most certainly not least, uh, we have Mr. Nicholas Ross, who is a climate change specialist with the Caribbean Development Bank. Uh, Mr. Ross will bring some experiences as it relates to the bank's uh, work as an accredited entity for the GCF and for other funds uh, and its efforts to bring support financing of CSOs um, in, in the region. So 
So we're going to be looking at four overarching questions this morning. Um, what are key actions being taken? What are current challenges, needs, priorities to the action? What are some best practices and innovations to inform the GCFs and other climate fund investments? And what are some of the key opportunities that can be leveraged to facilitate CSOs access um, to, to climate finance? So Diane, maybe we'll start with you. Um, and building on your point uh, in your introductory remarks where you outlined that we definitely cannot get where we're going without the participation of, of NGOs and CSOs um, and it's not just about uh, how do we get a seat at the table, but it's about how many seats do we get and, and carving out your space. What are some of the current efforts by the Department of Environment to support financing of CSOs um, to take action on climate change? And what are some of the key challenges that, that you've experienced with, with doing so? We're gonna give about five minutes to each of the responses and then um, try and have a dialogue at the end. Okay, thank, thanks, Fran, your first boss. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the Department of the Environment has had an interesting journey where our engagement with NGOs have, have been concerned. And it has been really, for the most part, really good. But um, to some extent, we've had some really bad experiences. And we all know that um, in the international community, in this field that we want to work, if you've had experiences or you've had, and if there's a perception of high risk of working, especially reputational risk, working with NGOs, this can become an issue. So in many of our small uh, countries, many NGOs start out strongly and they work well and they get a lot of funding support if they take a political perspective, for example, on, the, uh, on, on issues like the environment. So there's a lot of activism <laughs> that happens with NGOs and then, so they all start, of, start like activists and they're really good at activating. They're really good at language to get you thinking and, 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 and the debate going and so on, which is, you know, which is great. Okay, so then when you said, all right, let's go to implementation mode, let's start implementing some of the ideas. Um, the persons who become the activists, who were the activists may not necessarily be the best person who can actually implement the project. In fact, that's hardly ever the case. So when I started working first, personally with the Environmental Awareness Group in Antigua, is one of our longest standing um, environmental groups in Antigua. I was very active in the group. I worked with government, a member of the group, but they became so political that I had to make a choice. I either work with the group, either work on environmental issues as an NGO or within the government agency. And um, and this is something that like long time ago, it doesn't happen now much, but it was that like really antagonistic um, approach to uh, working with government with um, really political biting comments and so on. So it was adversarial. It wasn't cooperative, like what we need to move towards. So as we try to work towards um, a more cooperative partnership arrangement without necessarily um, leaving the, you can never leave the advocacy behind. Let me just put it that way. But the advocacy can turn into something else. Uh, maybe there's a different way, let me put it like to, to get it done. And so um, that was, a, that took a long time to transition NGOs in Antigua and Barbados to move from a political activist sort of arrangement or to wrap everything into a political activist. No matter what is the, whatever the environmental wrong, social wrong, it's the prime minister's fault. This, is, this was the messaging <laughs> that we got around NGO. And that was great for a while. It worked really well. It was a, it's a winning philosophy, it's a winning approach, but then it became, um, it was too much. It, it was time for implementation, time to join partnerships. And so you had to, NGOs had to transition to a new approach. So that took a while as well, cause you know, they're small. And so um, transitioning anybody and any organization is difficult. So, um, I've been working with government, my gosh, I won't tell you how many years, but long years, over 20 years. Um, so now we actually have a much better, so my dream was to work with NGO in the way that we're doing it now, like with EAG. And in EAG, we actually um, have them contracted to do actual work for us. So they are a you know, quasi-executing entity um, on our behalf. 
they provide us with technical advice. They form members of our committee. So they're not just members of our technical advisory committee. They actually do work on our behalf. They actually do all the technical, and we're actually seeking their support to actually manage um, protected areas. So we have in Wallens, we have an NGO, a community group that's actually managing the protected area. So it's really very different that way that they're moving, they're stepping up and saying, listen, I have, I am, I am no governance. It's not the prime minister alone. In the past, it was just the prime minister or the director of the department or the, you know, it was, it, that was a great lightning rod for them. Now, when you jump into a partnership, it's not as easy to criticize your partner in public. And how do you continue advocacy? And so we had to think about in the Department of the Environment, how can we help them to promote advocacy and still work with them? And this is where we're at now. And this is how we are trying to let NGOs understand that you have to watch your words. You can be advocates, but you have to be careful with what you say. And you know, in the Caribbean, um, which is what I love about the Caribbean, you can just jump on the radio and just, you know, <laughs> just say whatever. But um, it's interesting that we were submitting a project to the Green Climate Fund. And um, we got a, in our calls with them, they said, you know, the prime minister said so and so and so about something. I was like, oh my God, how would they even know that? I didn't even hear that, but they heard it. And then I had to say to them, you know, the prime minister costs everybody. <laughs> You know, me one day, uh, you know, a judge the other day, the opposition one day, even have his own cabinet members, you know, it's just our culture to do it. But, you know, underground, this is what he actually does. And we, we had evidence to show, yes, he's on his radio program on a Saturday morning saying what he has to say. And then, so, um, so there is that we have to realize that the culture, our culture of working together, um, like, the stuff my mom or our moms in the Caribbean would say to us would be considered um, abuse <laughs> in like North America, right? But we were like, oh, that's just mom. So it was really, we have to see ourselves the way other people see us and see. So so our, um, so our it's great to work with Canary because they, they, their advocacy role is really eloquent. And, and if Canary says something, bad about Antigua um, in a nice diplomatic way people understand but if they say but if they do go but and they say nice things too right so when something nice happens they say nice things and when they do that too carries weight so as an NGO you want to be able to create a dialogue and create an advocacy of that when you speak you create influence you buy influence when you criticize it is listened to and adhered to and listened with the intention of making change so not sparing, you know, smearing people's character and so on just because to get attention. So I think for, for us, this was our biggest challenge to overcome. And, um, and the best way we thought we could overcome it is that let us work with um, our traditional environmental NGOs, but also we decided let's add new ones. Let's, let's try our hands at new ones. So we started in a place that we nobody ever thought. We start in Antigua, but we have a lot of private schools. It's unique to Antigua. And they're not, you know, expensive. You know, um, anybody can go, in no matter how low income you are, many low income men and women, their children go to private school. And we they're pretty much a nonprofit organization. So we started to work with them. And they were great to work with, very easy. The teachers can write a proposal, make it very simple. So it was easy. Then we started to work with um, at sporting events, sporting groups, big influence all over Antigua and Barbara. And then we realized, wow, they have literally tens of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure all over the island. That will get destroyed in a hurricane. So they were willing to work with us. And, and they had a way of engaging. They had a, a, a set, teachers have a way of engaging community group have a way of engaging that was a more like I'm going to criticize you because I want an, uh, I want an action and so we started to work with churches as well and so we started to broaden the scope of entities that we are working with and we learned a lot from them and how to engage and so um, we're able now to have a broader range of NGOs and we use our surf fund to be able to work with them in a way that we are moving towards it, we're not there yet. Work with them in a way that even if they're critical of the government or Dan Blackleen or the department or the GCF or whoever, nobody can stop the funding flowing to them. 
And finally, we decided that we were going to codify all of this in law, in, in, in regulations. And then we were going to put aside a significant amount of our funding into providing training for them and providing technical assistance to them. And that in my mind is what's working. Thank you. That actually um, was very interesting and it did come up quite a bit in um, the interview process that we went through in developing the scoping report and the work that, um, I guess, non-traditional CSOs play in executing climate action in Antigua and Barbuda and whether it's, you know, your local um, church group, they weren't, they weren't necessarily aware of what they were implementing was climate action and supporting the national agenda. And so making that link was, was very interesting. Actually, so I'm I just may mention one. one of the first group we really worked well with was the Mother's Union in the Anglican Church. And every year we had Arbor Day, they would come and support Arbor Day. And I remember the first year we had it, it was okay, it was great. So we asked the Mother's Union to come and help us. It wasn't, oh my God, we had to call police to hold back the crowd. These women were so effective in bringing people for our tree planting activities. And they were so great and they cooked for everybody. And every year they were with us. I mean, they're not there now, but because um, a lot has changed in the churches, but they were great to partner with. That's, it actually brings me to a point that I, I know um, CBD, uh, CDB had mentioned during the interview process, and it was um, making sure that we come to the level of the CSOs when engaging. Yeah. Them. So that's a critical point. Um, so moving to Ms. Diaz Perez, um, I hope that I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, I want to ask, what have been the experiences and lessons learned by PACT in providing financing to CSOs um, for biodiversity conservation and climate change? Um, do you have any best practices that you want to share with, with the rest of the group here this morning? And I'll give you a, five minutes to proceed. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, glad to be here on this panel to share our uh, experiences and lessons learned. Um, the Protected Areas Conservation Trust is a statutory body in Belize um, with the National Conservation Trust Fund. And we work with over 20 um, conservation sector CSOs comprising of both uh, larger NGOs and CBOs as we know them. And we also work uh, with several state agencies that also work um, with protected areas and natural resources such as environment, forestry, uh, fisheries, biodiversity, and climate change. Um, we've been operational for 25 years, so we've been working uh, with CSOs that long. Um, there, there are several lessons learned um, along the way of that trajectory of 25 years, um, but uh, I want to share with you this morning one um, major lesson learned in the financing of, of CSOs here in Belize. And it is that we need to adapt a financing modality to be able to improve our impact and remain responsive to CSOs needs and their um, changing uh, operating environment and their changing structures as they also evolve throughout the years. Uh, for example, we have been, um, we have seen that or we found that we had to evolve our funding programs to be able to meet the needs of the CSOs and, and remain responsive to how they work. And so we evolved from what was a traditional um, short-term project funding to more long-term program investment with a more targeted approach. Um, and with that, we also changed how we engage CSOs. And we moved away from the traditional donor grantee approach to funding to a more partnership approach where we now see them as investment partners in the different interventions and efforts that they're undertaking um, as opposed to this trick where the donor you're the grantee um, approach to financing and that has made a huge difference in the level of engagement and support for um, projects being implemented by CSOs. Uh, and, and a benefit of that has been um, that it has given us an increased ability to increase leveraging potential of our investments um, because of that different approach that is now more long-term, CSOs have been able to take 
the financing from PAC, for instance, to be able to leverage additional funding and maximize the impact and reach of their projects. Um, and so it's, it becomes a win-win situation for all. And it has also uh, allowed us to improve our ability to do more impact monitoring and evaluation of those projects. Um, at the end of the day, after uh, we're putting in all this investment, we want to be able to see the impact that those projects are having. And so this new approach and this evolution that we have undertaken has allowed us to be, be able to better do that, not just at the level of the CSOs implementing the projects, but from a programmatic level for, for PAC as a, financing, um, as a financing source for these projects um, along, uh, among the CEO, um, CSO community, sorry. In terms of best practices, uh, there, there are several that we have, have seen, um, but one of them uh, is that we work with established coordination mechanisms. Um, I believe it was uh, one of the speakers prior that touched on it a bit, um, where we use the umbrella organizations to work with the smaller CSOs um, and CBOs. For instance, here we have the largest uh, conservation umbrella organization called APAMU, the Association of Protected Area Management Organizations of Belize. And we have a longstanding partnership with that umbrella organization. And we have been able to um, benefit from their ability to, to do a lot more outreach with their membership, to do a better advocacy, as well as have better access and connection to the government agencies that they have to work with simply because of their, um, the fact that they're in position to represent CSOs, um, both at the NGO and CBO level. And so that partnership with that organization um, has proven to be quite efficient um, for us in terms of uh, coordinating among CSOs, as well as implementing uh, interventions that have to do with uh, full on projects, but even other outreach uh, and net, simply networking activities um, and being able to engage CSOs a lot more efficiently through those umbrella networks. Um, another best practice that we have identified over the years is that along with project financing, um, we also have to complement that with capacity building or institutional development support. Um, and so our financing approach has also now included specific financing targeted capacity building of CSOs. Um, this has allowed us as well to maximize our impact, to be able to improve accountability um, among other benefits. For example, in our um, recent efforts, we have been building capacity of CSOs in um, frameworks for environmental, social, and gender mainstreaming, providing training um, in, in tools used to apply uh, for those, especially because we're looking to assist CSOs to access funds from the Adaptation Fund and Green Climate Fund, for instance. And so we've been able to, um, to get readiness funding to support the CSO community in building their capacity um, to improve uh, their ability to implement these projects and work with us as a partner in the design and implementation of climate finance um, climate projects. In our climate finance portfolio at PACT, um, one of the things that we've also done is uh, develop a stakeholder engagement plan. And that stakeholder engagement plan has essentially mapped out the stakeholders and identified the best mechanisms for us to be able to engage them and mobilize climate action in the country. And this we didn't only do for CSOs, but it also includes private sector as well as state agencies. Um, being that PACT is an accredited entity for uh, the GCF and the National Implementing Entity for the Adaptation Fund, we also have that broader role of engaging other sectors as well. But our lar largest sector, by all means, is the, is the CSO community. Um, and so we have identified formal mechanisms of how we will increase that engagement and better that engagement um, as it relates to accessing funds from these specific um, uh, climate financing sources. Um, currently, what we're working on specifically on climate change initiatives um, is that through a GCF readiness project that we're implementing, um, we are currently engaging uh, CSOs 
to um, identify PAPS project pipeline for the GCF. Um, and we're currently working with two CSOs, um, specifically for two concepts, one of whom is the um, umbrella organization of protected area organization. Um, on a project that we, the target is to climate smart, um, the protected area system of Belize. And uh, this is a project with an umbrella CSO that is targeting and will have the participation and provide benefits for um, a large number of their membership. And so through this uh, partnership with the umbrella organizations, we're gonna be reaching um, to the individual CSOs. Um, and then we're also working on another concept for disaster risk uh, management which, with another civil society organization that works in that um, disaster management sector as well. Um, and so uh, all of these lessons that we've learned and these best practices we're applying now as we develop our um, project pipeline for climate projects and those lessons learned have, have proven to be um, uh, quite effective uh, for us going forward. And so we um, will have a lot more lessons learned uh, to share um, with our colleagues as we proceed in the implementation of our climate finance portfolio. Thank you. Um, I will have to say that a lot of those did come up during the scoping study and uh, PACT was outlined as, as uh, an entity who had done it well and had been building upon and learning from the work that you had done in the past. And um, APAMO as an umbrella kind of organization in facilitating smaller CSOs to be able to participate in climate finance and access um, did also come up as, as a good example, example on that. So thank you very much. Um, I might come back on another question in a little while. Um, so moving to um, Ms. Leotard, and I hope I've also pronounced your last name correctly. Um, what have been the experience and lessons by Canary? Uh, I know that you have been working a lot with with on the regional level and um, actually Canary came up quite a few times as one of the uh, potentially better placed organizations at a regional level to support uh, CSOs on a multi country or to facilitate that um, more at a, at a regional scale rather than just at the national. So I would um, welcome your, your input on experience and lessons learned um, that could potentially guide some of these efforts that we are, are going forward with. Thank you so much, Frances, and great to be here. Um, the host has disabled screen sharing. I actually prepared just three little slides to keep myself on track. So I don't know if I inco or any of them can share it. Um, so I think, as, as you've heard already, Canary is a non-profit technical organization working across the Caribbean for 30 years. And what's been, I think, unique is this role we played as an intermediary, um, really supporting channeling funds down to um, national and local civil society organizations, community enterprises, and the funds that they serve. So, we have administered since 2016, I've done the, the counts, thanks Anka, if you could do the second slide. Um, you know, over the past years, since 20, 2006, we've actually uh, managed um, 20 grant programs for 10 funders, um, totaling 6.5 million across 15 countries and territories and the regional level. And this has really ranged from the very micro grants that are maybe a thousand dollars up to you know the 100,000, 150,000, 200,000 even um, size grants. So I think drawing on, on the, the lessons from PAC just now, Canary has done this with multiple different grant programs and there's really a need to tailor each one to who you're targeting, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I think that, that was a valuable lesson. I'd like to endorse what Pat just said. So based on that, this, next slide, please, Anka. Some of the lessons to highlight, you know, this is not a, a, an, an idea. This is not a theory we have that CSOs can actually deliver real climate action. You know, I wanted to say first lesson, this is fact. 
Um, we have seen the amazing results of these organizations, the work that they're doing, particularly as I think um, Unami and Diane targeted in their, said in their intro, reaching the most vulnerable. So this is a fact, um, you know, civil society organizations are doing amazing work on the ground and therefore they must be part of, of climate action and we have to find a way to, to support them. The second point, I think a lot of people discount the importance of the very tiny grants, the micro and small. Um, you know, for example, the, your, your study, your mapping only looked at 50,000 and up. But we need to appreciate that many hundreds of, of projects being implemented by civil society organizations are at the much smaller level. And I, I think it's important because we also need to support the civil society organizations that cannot manage $50,000. The ones that need $1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 and help to manage that. And through implementing that project, they learn and grow. And can, their next project can be bigger and their next project can be bigger. So I think um, we need to not discount the value of finding ways, for example, part story of, of channeling through local um, national umbrella organizations to really reach these very tiny organizations who are valuable and do invaluable work and can grow. Um, I think, you know, we have feel really validated in Canary about this role we've been playing as a Caribbean civil society nonprofit intermediary. Um, and we'd really like to, to push this as a lesson that many other organizations can play this role at the regional and the national level. Um, and the value that, that CSOs bring as intermediaries to help challenge funds is, you know, their local knowledge, their relationships, they're leveraging all that. And that makes it very cost effective to use them as intermediaries. They are on the ground or they already have relationships that, that they're leveraging. And they're going to be there in the long term. I'm, you know, sorry to say, all these big funds will come and they will go. And we in civil society are still going to be here working. So I think that there's a lot of reasons um, to use civil society organizations as intermediaries. I'd like to plug that. Um, next slide, please, Ayanka. Then some, some broader lessons, best practices and innovations, maybe. Um, I think design financing programs using participatory country-driven approaches. Um, engage civil society organizations in asking what are the needs, what are the priorities, what would work for you to take climate action. It seems so obvious, but it's not done. Uh, you know, donors come in, here's the program. Okay, you apply to, to these priorities and we try and make our work fit. Um, and that doesn't really make sense. And the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, I think does an amazing job of doing tremendous science um, to develop what they call their profile of the region. And then actually doing consultations on the ground in target countries to find out what civil society organizations, what government and others really need um, to happen and how can they then have an investment that makes sense. Um, I think this coordinating among financing initiatives, a lot of donors and a lot of us, I guess, just naturally live in our box and have our blinkers on, the head down trying to do work. And I think particularly in the climate space, obviously, where there's so huge a need, there is need to collaborate and coordinate among the different financing, um, in the, the different investments in the region in, in climate action. Um, and Canary did some work with, with 16 donors who are working now, who are investing in, in ocean action, who all support civil society through small grants. And this was done under the Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem Project. And we brought together these donors and they really said, look, we don't know what other people are doing. We're very interested in knowing, we're very interested in sharing lessons, best practices, and when we actually mapped what the H were doing, we realized several were working in similar areas and there was potential for synergies, but there were gaps in terms of what the regional priorities had been identified as, and no one was investing in those areas. So there is this need to bring together the different um, grant programs and, and sharing and, and coordination. 
I think another best practice is supporting CSOs with project development. And of course, many, many donors do this. For example, the, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund Ecosystem Adaptation Facility. Once you get past the little concept note stage, you get a little bit of funding to, to develop your full proposal. Um, and I think particularly recognizing the complexity of some of these applications, there is no way civil society organizations can spend a year and two years in project development processes for Green Climate Fund, Adaptation Fund, and so on. People need to understand the reality. Civil society organizations do not have core funds. No one is giving them money to just show up every day <laughs> um, and invest in long-term development. They simply do not have the funds, um, therefore the time to do this. And so this must be addressed. If we're serious about civil society being able to access these, these grant programs, they need capacity help um, to spend the time, not to bring a consultant in to do it for them, give them the money so they can spend the time. Um, like PACT, an important lesson on the need to, to invest, um, not only in delivering a project, planting mangroves or whatever, but actually investing your funding in building the capacity of the civil society organization while you're doing that. Um, CEPF, Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, for example, does that through taking a piece of their grant towards maybe strengthening your, your financial management system or strategic plan or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, at Canaries, other, other programs we run, we actually do parallel grants. One grant for your technical work and one grant for you to strengthen your organization based on a needs assessment, what are your priorities? And so we need to, to, to say, we can't just say civil society organizations don't have the capacity to access and deliver. We need to build that capacity through the grant program itself. And that should be an explicit aim of the financing to build the CSO's capacity every, every step forward um, they, they take. Um, Canary, I think, is well known for our, our hand-holding, our coaching and mentoring that we do. So our role as an intermediary, I don't think we're seen as a donor. Um, we're seen as someone helping civil society organizations to access funds and, and deliver them. So we have this hand-holding approach. And we have a network of people we have trained in countries. I think the number is 47 in 17 countries who are people on the ground who actually sit down with the, the organizations and help them develop the project, help them with their, their implementation plans, their work plans and their budgets and their reports, um, check in with them, how are things going? When there's a crisis, help them figure out what to do to adapt that. And Canary has that approach as well. It's a hand-holding relationship, not a, um, you know, I'm holding you accountable and you're gonna get in trouble if anything goes wrong relationship. So that partnering is very important, especially for small organizations who are growing. And just finally, if you know, the report that was done, which I think was excellent, by the way, um, I did read it in detail. Um, you know, if we're saying there's potential for civil society organizations to form these coalitions to access um, climate finance, they need help to do that. We need to invest um, in, in providing the platforms for them to organize and get together and, and to make that happen. Um, so thanks very much. Sorry I drew on so long. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. You brought some um, really important points there and it, it reminded me that um, one of the critical things that came out, um, not just from CSOs, but from many of the NDAs and uh, the kind of more regional organizations was the role of CSOs in bringing kind of community knowledge into project proposals and bringing what I started to call um, civil society science, essentially, you know, um, big climate models aren't downscaled to the size of not just the region, let alone smaller countries, for example, within the OECS, etc and forget it by the parish or community level. And, and so documenting that at the level of the CSO was very critical in um, you know, outlining that um, climate rationale and the, um, 
the need for financing to target that that situation and, and CSOs are, are really critical there. Um, so Mr. Roth, uh, now we're going to go to the bank um, and want to know, I know the, the Caribbean Development Bank has recently become accredited to the GCF and of course is also an intermediary for a variety of other funds in the region. But I want to know a little bit more on what are your current efforts or what the bank's current efforts are in supporting um, CSOs uh, to be able to take action on climate change. How are you incorporating CSOs in your work? And apologies, we are running a little bit over. So if you could please try and keep it to five minutes as well. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Francis. And, and thanks to everyone. Um, I think the, the contributions in discussion so far have been really, really interesting and really helpful. Um, you know, just to give a little bit of perspective for CDB, I think um, to, to help frame how we're approaching these issues right now, in particular in, in partnership with the Green Climate Fund, you know, from our perspective, the urgency of this issue is perhaps at times not being discussed sufficiently. Um, and the fact that the investment decisions that are going to be made over the next decade essentially are going to have a huge impact on the long-term trajectory uh, for a lot of countries and communities here in the Caribbean. And so I, I think that that urgency and the need to reach scale also has to factor into these discussions uh, about um, you know, how, where, and in what capacity we, we engage with CSOs in the context of climate change adaptation. And, and just to say too, I mean, from, from CDB's perspective, I fully agree that, that with, with some of the previous statements that have been made, in, including from um, from Una May Gordon and, and from Ambassador um, Diane Black Lane, that you know adaptation is local, and that's absolutely true. Uh, but but adaptation is also happening at at the utility scale and at infrastructure scale. And I think then when we're talking about where and how to work with and through um, CSOs, it's important to think about what types of adaptation are needed and, and what types of sectors and subsect subsectors we're looking at. And at least from our perspective, one of the sort of two of the really key areas, and this is by no means exhaustive, but two of the really, really key areas would be um, scaling up the adoption of climate resilient agricultural practices in, in the Caribbean, and then ecosystem-based adaptation or, or nature-based solutions as the GCF likes to keep calling them. Um, and, and I think that that sort of framing is a very important one, one to keep in mind. Specifically with regards to what the bank is doing then in that area, that logic or that rationale has kind of framed our, our plans at the moment. So with the GCF, we're, we've prioritized a number of initiatives that are at the, you know, sort of the public and utility and infrastructure scale, uh, also initiatives working with the private sector, but then also an initiative that's in our pipeline at the moment where we're looking to work um, with community-based organizations to scale up the adoption of climate resilient agricultural practices and, and ecosystem-based adaptation, recognizing also that these two areas are closely interlinked. Um, so we're, we're looking in particular at a, a setting up a grant facility uh, that would support community-based organizations and, and other CSOs uh, in these areas um, in partnership with the GCF. Um, this is something that uh, would build on a lot of the experience that CDB has had so far in working uh, with and through community-based organizations. So uh, I'm sure several people on, on today's discussion will be familiar with the Basic Needs Trust Fund uh, that CDB manages, uh, which, which does a lot of community-oriented uh, support. Um, and, and also perhaps one good example would be the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund that CDB has been um, administering over the past several years. Uh, and both of those initiatives in particular, I think have given CDB a lot of important lessons learned that we're then trying to apply to this, to this grant facility. Um, I, I won't go through all of them also, you know, in the interest of time, but there, you know, we've had, for example, some evaluations uh, done, independent evaluations done of the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund. Um, that highlighted some really, really important lessons. And, you know, I think that um, Nicole in, in her presentation, she touched on quite a few of them. So I won't, won't go through them in, in too much detail now. Um, but maybe three that I would really like to highlight. Um, the capacity of community development agencies and the organizations within individual countries that are responsible for climate change, the, the capacity of both those organizations, but also the extent to which they work together uh, is, is frankly insufficient in many contexts right now. And that is, I think, inhibiting a lot of uh, community-based action on climate change. It's sort of somewhat segmented and siloed. Uh, and so programs that, that we are working on, including this grant facility program that I've mentioned, is going to be looking at how to strengthen those, those linkages in order to be able to 
uh, you know, not just achieve successful results during the, in, during the implementation of the program, but also afterwards, because I think we need to be looking at long-term sustainable solutions that can carry on even after external grant financing or, or whatever other kinds of financial instruments uh, uh, have been exhausted and the implementation of those programs has been complete. So we're looking at trying to set up a new equilibrium there uh, within the partner countries that, that would be beneficial. Uh, one that was also mentioned earlier, but I, I'd like to highlight again, is awareness and understanding. Um, you know, I mean, it seems at times like a bit of a, a oversimplification to say communities, community-based organizations, the private sector, whoever, are just simply not aware of climate change impacts and how it will affect their lives or livelihoods or business models. And, and of course, that's not the entire explanation for, you know, it's not the, the entirety of the barriers that are inhibiting climate action at that level but it's a very, very important one. We've seen this time and time again. It's not that they're unaware of climate change, it's that they're unaware of the specific ways in which their livelihoods or their business models will be affected by climate change. And so any program like the one that we're planning to do with GCF that would set up a grant facility really needs to emphasize that degree of, of uh, or enhancing that degree of awareness among community-based organizations, ensuring that the information, which in many countries, frankly, is, generated. It, th there is very robust climate information there. It's just not getting down to the people who need it in many cases. Um, that's not to say that there aren't data gaps in general. Of course there are, but there is more robust information available than many of us, I think, recognize, and it's just not reaching the people who need it. And so we're going to be trying to make an em uh, trying to emphasize that within the context of this program too, uh, both you know in terms of directly supporting it during the program, but also being able to try and help at least to set up or strengthen the systems uh, that would actually facilitate the dissemination and uptake of that information uh, in a more sustainable way. Uh, the third issue that I'd really like to touch on is the capacity of community-based organizations. Um, you know, I think many of us would love to be able to administer as much of this grant financing or other forms of financing as possible directly to and through community-based organizations. And in fact, I mean, CDB has done exactly that through the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund. But capacity constraints at that level has emerged as a major bottleneck. And that's something that came out in the evaluations that we've done. Uh, and there are, as other speakers have discussed, innovative models and, and other models of, of uh, trying to channel those resources down to the community level to ensure that communities are empowered to be able to shape how those resources are spent without necessarily having to put the burden on them to do all of the financial management and the procurement and the reporting, particularly with the Green Climate Fund, which is, I mean, as we all know, slightly more onerous, let's say, uh, than, than other, I see people laughing, that's good, uh, uh, slightly more onerous than other potential sources of financing. And so those are just constraints that have to be taken into consideration. So we are, again, looking at other ways of, of trying to channel those resources down to the community level without necessarily um, running into that bottleneck because as i said before we have an extremely urgent challenge where we cannot afford implementation delays of two to three years for us for a you know a two hundred thousand dollar community-based sub project and we need to reach scale because the the scale of this challenge i mean it will affect all aspects of our economies and livelihoods here in the caribbean um, so that's the third point and the fourth point that i really just like to make is on the policy and regulatory environment um, you know particularly when looking at nature-based solutions uh, whether that's the rehabilitation and restoration of coastal ecosystems or inland inland ecosystems or whatever it might be uh, the work that happens through a grant facility or, or through a, a program that channels resources down to the community level cannot be isolated from the broader policy and regulatory environment in which those sectors operate and it's very, very important you know, to strengthen the policies, the incentives, and the regulatory framework to ensure and incentivize, for example, agricultural communities to manage natural resources and, and their local ecosystems in a more sustainable manner to, just to give an example, ensure that uh, our, our inland ecosystems uh, actually have the water infiltration capacity that's needed uh, in order to provide the water I think we've lost. I was just about to ask if it yeah. was okay. Um, well, no problem. I hope that he he joins back um, soon. And I know that he was wrapping up on on that last last point there. But I think that those those critical points were really important and raised um, quite a few few issues that are 
really important for not just the CDB, but also other entities to be reflecting on um, in how we can kind of scale up um, the participation and access of CSOs to, to climate finance in the region, um, especially as it relates to looking at longer term timelines for execution and looking at the results, kind of translating that large scale financing of the GCF into the hands of, of smaller scale CSOs in the region. I know that in the process of doing the um, scoping report, uh, you know, for many CSOs in the smaller Caribbean countries, even a $10,000 um, grant was quite a lot to monitor and report on. And so we have to find innovative ways in, in doing things to make sure that we are inclusive and we have impact on the ground in the communities where, where it does make the most impact. So we've had a few questions in the chat and I would strongly encourage um, our panelists to um, to respond to some of those. And I know that we probably won't be able to touch on all of them this morning because we have gone a little bit over, but I, I think the discussion thus far has been really fruitful. Um, and we will continue to respond to questions in the chat as we go on and as we move to breakout groups. And I hope that even within some of the breakout groups, some of these questions will be, will be addressed. So um, maybe looking to um, Pat, maybe you'll be able to take one of Mrs. Uh, Diaz Perez, you'll be able to take one of these questions about, um, where is it? I'm just scrolling up. What are some of the measures of successful projects? Um, and, and how, what are kind of the key components of having a successful CSO project? Uh, thank you for that question. Let me um, try to answer in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> yes. We, thank you. Um, one of the focus of our uh, programs and, and projects at this time is that we identify um, specific targets. So we have targets at the project level and then we have targets at the program level. Um, and so most of our investments, uh, as I had mentioned, they're targeted investments. And so we identify specific indicators of impact, um, which we equate to the, to the level of success of these projects. And so we monitor those throughout implementation um, and we, we assist the CSOs in um, putting in any type of interventions or measures, adjusting um, those indicators as implementation progresses. And so at the end of a project, or even before the end of a project, we have been measuring the level of success uh, towards the objectives and the goal of those projects. And so we, um, we identified specific targets and specific indicators for meeting those targets along the way. Um, and we do that at the project level as well as the program level. And those indicators are what we use as the measures um, of success of those projects. And that includes all different types of indicators depending on what the nature of the project is. I trust that answer is in a nutshell. Thank you, thanks so much. Um, maybe I will turn back to Ambassador Black Lane. Um, in maybe one sentence or less, um, what is what would you outline as one key recommendation um, that you would uh, give that would be to leverage additional resources to support CSOs and local communities? Sorry. <laughs> um, I would say packaging of the project. Like just package it just for them. You know, just don't try and give them something. You know, we make projects so complicated. Yeah, it has 10 different things. Just make it so simple. Install renewable energy. Um, count how much mosquito larvae in the waterway. Like yeah. really simple, straightforward, uh, one page. Um, like break it down into small bits and bits and then and keep them doing, you know. Okay, so we want them to expand their capacity, but what we have, as Nicole was saying, where are they gonna sustain that, right? So, I mean, you want them to expand their capacity a little bit, but, and then you ask them to do things that they don't, they weren't doing, it. it's not there, it wasn't, they do things they're passionate about, 
give them projects that are consistent with that. That's what I would say. Package it, but what are they passionate about? And then give them that. Don't try and take their passion and let them use their passion to do something you would want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then maybe I'll follow that up um, over to Nicole. Um, how do you envision uh, Canary's role to try and make that happen in reality with CSOs? We're looking, I mean, the GCF looks at, as it was indicated, significant portions or large amounts of money but the majority of CSOs in the region are very small scale and aren't going to be accessing $10 million projects. Um, so how do you envision that for the region or even you know, for the entities that you work with? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple things. One of which is Canary's advocacy and sharing our lessons and best practices on what can work. But I do think the power of, of networks um, and networks among donors, networks among the NDAs and government agencies, and networks among CSOs. So I really think if we start to mobilize coalitions, and I actually am not an advocate for necessarily always forming a, a, an umbrella organization in a country if there isn't one already. It doesn't mean we can't have informal coalitions. And Canary actually does this, and we have some amazing partners we work with all the time um, and, and form coalitions to, to execute a project um, or, or where we can form coalitions and say, how can civil society organizations help the NDA with delivery of projects? Let's sit down and have a plan and think how we can collaborate together to make that happen. So it's not one um, mechanism, but it's really mobilizing stakeholders around the region how can we collaborate and play different roles? Thank you. And then maybe noting the time, I'll go to um, back to Mr. Ross. I hope you're still on, Nicholas. Um, can you, there's a question in the chat uh, and there's a multiple parts of the question, but maybe um, you can synthesize it. Can you share any ways that the bank is changing the way it is working with CSOs? Um, is technical assistance, coaching, mentorship, support, long-term partnerships, part of the evolving framework that you are looking at? Um, and is it a consideration, you know, reframing the way that the bank is looking at partners and with CSOs? I know that you had mentioned a new program that you have in the pipeline. Maybe you'd want to speak a little bit more um, to that. Sure, thanks. And, and sorry, I think I dropped off earlier, uh, just as I was about to wrap up that I have to say in a year of remote working now, it's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, so that's uh, hopefully we're near the end of that year and it won't happen again. But um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's it's a very good one. And, um, you know, the the Absolutely, we are, I think, gradually changing the way that we work with CSOs. Uh, I mean, obviously, I can't speak uh, to what the entire bank is doing necessarily, uh, because CS engagement with CSOs is something that's covered across many different areas of the bank. And uh, I work primarily in the context of climate change and, and the Green Climate Fund work. But certainly what we're trying to do in that context is draw on the lessons learned from the other areas of the bank and from the other, from the other um, units and divisions that do work with CSOs on a regular basis, too in order to ensure that we, we bring that to bear within the context of a program like this. So as I mentioned, um, you know, the, the idea of basically working in partnership with CSOs rather than basically providing grant uh, financing and, and a series of eligibility criteria and waiting for CSOs to come to us with their ideas, but rather to more proactively reach out to CSOs and actually assist them to identify and develop those project ideas as well um, so that we get it uh, from that side as well. Uh, and then, as also I mentioned, you know, I mean, the, the Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund and the Basic Needs Trust Fund use relatively different models through which to channel resources down to, to the community level. Uh, and I think that what we're trying to do now is learn the lessons from, from one and, and uh, apply it to, to, um, to the other, so to speak, in a way that uh, we'd be working rather than directly through community-based organizations exclusively, but also trying to balance that uh, with some more um, large scale channels through which we'd implement the resources. 
uh, so that you might have a, a national coordinating entity, for example, that would um, you know, be trained on and, and able to manage the procurement uh, and then work in partnership with the communities in order to assist them to, to shift some of the burden and the administrative processes from the community level to, to a slightly higher level where they have the capacity, uh, both in terms of procurement and financial management in order to be able to do that at scale. Um, so th those are some of the key lessons uh, that I would say uh, we're, we're trying to apply. Thank you. I think that that last one is, is really important as we start to look at scale of financing and the types of requirements that are being placed on that scale, um, not just from the GCF, but other, whether it be bilateral, multilateral partners. Um, I had a very good conversation with, uh, I think, your community development specialist at CDB feeding into the scoping report, and he gave some really good insight as to how the, the, the bank is hoping to be working going forward. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I can wrap up all of the fruitful discussion that that just took place over the panel. Um, and I, I'd like to thank our panelists for for their contribution and apologies that we weren't able to get to all of the questions in the chat, but I, I encourage you to continue to ask them and we hope that not just panelists, but um, our team at Climate Analytics, uh, the team at IASD and at Canary will will continue to respond to those. Um, and with that, Anka, I think that we can wrap up. And on that, I would also interpreters say that I think we can wrap up here. Um, thank you all very much and see you tomorrow.